First of all, I want to I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, this is has been a tradition of the Rock Center to host uh, Leo Strain and his colleagues from the Delaware uh, Court of Chancery and now the, the Delaware Supreme Court. And it is a great honor for us to host them again uh, this year. And we've uh, invited as well Joe Grunfest and Ron Gilson, our faculty, and Catherine Henderson from Wilson Sonsini to have a discussion not only uh, of Delaware Court, but a bit more expansive in, in practice and academia. And we think this will be a very interesting view for all of you who come from the law school as students, but also for practitioners. So just doing this short introduction, I know we have a lot to talk about, and so I'll leave it to Joe to start from here. But thank you again uh, for coming. Uh, the Rock Center is always happy to host these programs, and you can visit our website for all our different events that we have during the year. So thank you very much. Joe? Great. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here as a moderator of such an extraordinary panel. Uh, and as some of you may have heard, we are in the early throes, and throes is probably the right word, of a campaign for the presidency of the United States. <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever you may think about the merits of the issue, I do think it's one of the more entertaining campaigns uh, that we've had, although you know, maybe entertainment should not be the measure uh, by which we look at this. But the, the theme, if there is going to be a theme for our discussion this evening, it's going to be about elections and about electoral policies and about electoral politics and about how the notions of elections and representative government play themselves out both in our larger political sphere and in the way we run corporations in the United States. Um, and, and with that, by way of a very rough and gentle overview, what I'd like to do is, is open up our panel with a discussion about the Supreme Court's decision in the Citizens United case. Uh, which may well be one of the most controversial Supreme Court opinions of the past decade. Um, it's, it's broadly predicted that Citizens United is likely to lead to an outpouring of proxy proposals in the coming season, um, and these proposals will call for corporations to disclose their political uh, uh, contributions and also their lobbying activities. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission is under significant pressure from Congress and various interest groups uh, to adopt these rules requiring corporate disclosure, and at the same time, the latest version of the budget bill contains a provision preventing the SEC from actually adopting any rules that would require such disclosure. Um, the, the, the Citizens United decision and the reaction to it raises many, many different questions. Um, and the first, and I think fundamental one, would be to ask this panel what the panel's views are of the quality of the Supreme Court's analysis of corporate law in the Citizens United opinion, and what you see as the implications of the Citizens United opinion for the evolution of corporate and securities law, as well as for the evolution of our political process. Because if there's one area in the world today where corporate law and the political process comes together, it's this intersection of Citizens United and the election that's happening in, in Iowa tonight. Mr. Chief Justice, so any thoughts? So we have an hour on this? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is a great example of, uh, you know, in my mind, judicial overreaching, creating a societal problem <coughs> that did not exist, and resulting in potentially perverting two um, related but distinct realms of American life that are very important to us. One is the political process itself. The other is the process of wealth creation through um, you know, business entities. And what I mean, you know, I can't go through everything, but the reality is the understanding of corporate law in the opinion is extremely primitive and unhistorical. <laughs> Um, at the time of the founding, is that is that a word for originalist? Well, I wrote it. I've written a thing called a, a original, originalist or original, in the sense of being original like a novel that goes through in a detailed way about whether you can rationalize Citizens United as originalist and conclude whether you can support the opinion or not. I don't believe you can justify it on historical grounds. 
reality is when we founded our, at the time of the founding of the Republic, all corporations were specifically chartered by government. The ultra vires doctrine was extremely potent. When you went to general chartering, which is the ability to do anything for, you know, essentially the broadest form is you could act, you could do any lawful business by any lawful means. It was assumed that the, the political realm could determine what the corporation did. Some of the earliest uh, opinions when you went to general chartering were in areas like political contributions and courts held them to be ultra vires. Radical people like Teddy Roosevelt and his advisors were among the first to call for restrictions on political contributions. Um, the Montana law that the Supreme Court struck down was over 100 years old. And the interesting thing is, again, why was this not a problem? Well, the reality is it, American, America's approach to this, that corporations could essentially, in the political realm, only do what government let them to do, actually cohered with um, philosophy, and particularly conservative corporate philosophy, about corporations. Conservative thinkers like Milton Friedman and others were tremendously suspicious about corporate boards' ability to use corporate funds for purposes that were unrelated to business. There was a real legitimacy problem, and their argument, and I think a right one, was that the only thing that really united stockholders was their interest in investing in the corporation and making it profitable. And that to the extent that the corporation, you know, if you wanted corporations to behave in a certain way to be good for society, then you taxed them, you regulated them. Um, it didn't mean you can't pay the workers more, but there should be a rational relationship between how you treat your workers and, um, and profit. And that if your stockholders wanted to use their money in the political process, then with the dividends that they make and the capital gains they make, they can invest it for themselves. Congress took a fairly sensible approach to this all. Did, did Congress say that corporations couldn't act on the political process? No. You could form a PAC and use corporate funds to form a PAC. And you could get, you could test this thing about whether you were a model for democracy and why everybody was investing in ExxonMobil because you wanted ExxonMobil to give political contributions. And you could seek to have your investors and your employees give to the PAC. And in fact, that's what the Supreme Court, Joe, says that labor unions have to do. But that was what struck down in a case that had nothing to do with for-profit political corporations that could have been decided on narrower grounds. And the Supreme Court itself, the supposedly restrained ones, were the ones who expanded the question before the court. What are the two realms they're polluting? Most CEOs did not want to give. Can you guess why you didn't want to be able to give? I'll tell if you. If you can't give, they can't ask. ask. <laughs> So yeah, it was a be... tremendously useful thing in running a business. It's the no shakedown. Works. Right, exactly. And so you couldn't do that. The other thing is people want to run their business. Did it, did it ever bar you from spending? Was there some lack of hiring of lobbying? None of that was effective. Everybody had lobbyists to lobby their regulations and stuff. But the reality is it kept you from being sh shaken down. It kept from you from doing things. Now you have a huge distraction. So business is now being drawn into something that isn't useful. The political process is now changing. Yes, people will say corporations are not the drivers, it's the super PACs. One, that's hard to separate because we know so little about where the money's coming from and a lot of the money in the super PACs is in fact corporate money. And when people who use corporations to insulate themselves from societal regulation are then spending their wealth, it's hard to separate that either from the corporate form. And by the way, Sheldon Adelson, for example, Las Vegas Sands is a corporation. Much of his giving is through something called Las Vegas Sands, which is a corporation. And we, the U.S. Chamber's contributions are way up, and most of their money is being raised from corporations. So you now have this thing where we're justifying this mountain of money going to politics. Then you get, the, what is the other domain that's going to, you know, so that's going to pollute the political process itself. And you can't just talk about things like, oh, Bernie Sanders is doing well. You have to look at whether you get laws passed, Joe, and that's what I've written about. The reality is it affects the agenda. It affects whether you can get things through Congress because to get money, you have to go where it is. And you had a town out here in California, right, where they barely beat back an oil company. For the third time, an oil company, an oil company whose plant has blown up twice and killed people and polluted a town, 
went into a town of 300 million people, 300,000 people, set up two, three, two or three political organizations, and spent something like $5 million, Joe, to try to unelect thing. That has an effect on your state legislators and all. But then they get into this thing about how are we going to solve it. The major mutual funds basically abstain from these political proxy things, so I don't know what they're going to do. And the reason why I don't want to blame them, how does the dividend momentum fund or the Vanguard in Index 500 fund think about voting on politics? Ordinary Americans don't have enough money to buy and sell securities in individual companies. The contribution limit in a 401k is a reproach to even above average people like me. I never hit it. I don't get to vote any of the stock. I get to vote for my mutual fund. It's institutional investors, money managers, who will vote on these proposals, Joe. So you have the most ludicrous thing, and I'll stop with this, the most ludicrous thing in the world is to have corporations which, have, which are not formed for anything related to politics, having referendums about involvement in the political process where the outcomes are going to be determined by Vanguard, Fidelity, Barclays, um, all these different things. Any of those people breathe the air? They're not, they're entities, they're money managers, and they can't reconcile our views because we don't give them our money for any reason related to investing in the political process. We don't. And by the way, we often don't give them our money because we really want to. We give them our money because we have to, because the, to save for retirement, we have no choice. And can we get it out? Can we pick individual stocks? No. Until we're 59, Unless we want to face Castro-like expropriation, the money management industry has our funds. So I don't get this. The Supreme Court's model that about corporate democracy is totally wrong. Most corporate scholars, like Ron and Joe, would say that stockholders don't have enough power to influence business issues. How are you going to mobilize people about political issues? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It was a problem of judicial creation. And there was no problem to be solved, and it's unhistorical. And if people want to justify it, then they have to justify it by that they made something up. And don't try to claim it's some thing where for 200 years we didn't realize that there was this huge impingement on freedom. So. But what do you really think, Leo? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have much more to say. I mean, I've written about this. I mean, I, I actually think no, that Leo has actually written extensively on the topic, and it really is some of the most uh, learned and detailed uh, information that's out there. Uh, and, and if you want to explore the intersection of uh, American politics and American corporate governance, uh, Leo's pieces, there are at least two of them. Yes. Well, yeah. there's actually a third, because the other thing that plays into it is at the same time as we're freeing these corporations, we're making special rules for them, which is the Hobby Lobby decision, the idea that you can opt out from neutral secular legislation, and we were going to treat the corporation as identical to whoever governs it at the time. And so that you can actually exempt yourself, right? The, I mean, the Hobby Lobby thing is absolutely outrageous because it's like saying, well, you know, there was a time when, when employers didn't give people their wages directly. They would give them company scrip. And you would have to buy it at the store because we didn't want the Irish people, you know, we didn't want to, you know, people like British Isles origin like me, you know, drinking. We didn't want the women, you know, we wanted to make sure the women were hygienic and we did all this kind of stuff. Congress banned that stuff. They banned people paying money in anything other than wages. What was the guarantee in the, in the Affordable Care Act? A minimum health guarantee. And part of the package was that you could get contraception. It was your choice. It was part of the guarantee you got as an American worker that you had to get this. There are many medical treatments that offend different religious faiths. By the way, the people in Hobby Lobby, several of the contraceptives that they then objected to had been previously funded until they had their crisis of conscience. And the answer of the Supreme Court was the rest of us would pay for this. I, I, I've had, you know, I've had to do 20 or more Jehovah's Witnesses blood transfusion and guardianships. You know, have somebody, you want to work at a company where a devout Jehovah's Witness doesn't believe in, in any surgical procedure that involves a blood transfusion? And is it because I'm raised Catholic? I just spoke at a Catholic law school. It's because five of you know five of the justices are Catholic, and come out of a particular strand, that it's okay to deny women 
part of their what they earned as workers and to conceive of it as the company's right that it offends the company's right how you get to spend your health insurance this is the same supreme court so we're giving all these corporations we're giving them an amazing amount we're allowing them to opt out of what they are because if you're actually a separate entity you don't have a religious belief you're not a protestant corporation you're not a muslim corporation I, I'm just saying this is a really interesting ideological movement all being created by people who wrote you at Rome. So I want, I'll let Catherine and Ron get in on it. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's play with this one, Leo, because the Hobby Lobby one in, in many respects makes, with respect to corporate law, makes me crazier than the, the first one. So we got a, we've got a company, and it'll meet the Labor Department's rules. So it's, it's seven, there's a controlling group who, are, uh, who own 70% of the stock, and they're deeply committed to one or another uh, religious principles, uh, and the thirty percent minority aren't. And I'm going to make to make the uh, to make the hypo to, ma to make the hypothetical work. Uh, my assumption is that they're actually going to be honest, and they're not going to tell the story about well, we we do this because it'll bring in a lot of business from right. uh, from people. <laughs> they're actually going to be honest about it. I don't know how you make that religious. You make that religion. I'm just sort of straight. Simple corporate law. How you make that religious preference on the part of the majority not run into the pro not run in directly into the problem of what about the minority who it's costing them money because the controlling shareholders uh, have a personal preference. Well, and I think it's even more than that when you get into the theories of the First Amendment, which the Supreme Court has embraced embraced in the case of labor unions. I think it is much more logical to think that people who are represented by a labor union are coming together for associational purposes and or represented by them and that the labor union of which you're taking a benefit should be able to spend politically, right? But the Supreme Court has long held, and they may even take away the ability to make you pay for the collective bargaining, but what they've long held is you have to have a check the box. And if the labor union is going to spend any of your dues money for the political process, you have to agree to it, right? And if you don't do it that way, it's a violation of the First Amendment rights of the folks who are represented by the union on the grounds that they don't have choice. Their idea of corporate law now, Ron, is that, that you get to, you know, it's much easier to free, to free yourself as a stockholder. You don't actually have to invest. One of the things in my most recent article I pointed out is that's actually not true. It's actually in the American economy now, you're much more likely to be able to find a job in a non-union workplace then you are to be able to fund your retirement by not turning over your money to money managers until you're 59. I don't know any way that you can get yourself out of the idea of turning over your funds to people. And if the idea is then, I'm not doing it. I, I invest, I'm basically entirely indexed, except I have the one, one of the money managers who's typed Shakespeare. I've got the guy from Contra Fund. I don't give any of their money, my money for them to make political decisions. And I think there's a strong argument for all of this, a pass-through voting, which is something we went away from. You know, there were liberal ideas with Ralph Nader and other things of, of, of things. And when you start having corporations get out of what they do, and then they have money managers refereeing this, Ron, I don't really understand the Supreme Court where they're coming from because they won't own their associational things. And actually, jo Justice Scalia wrote an opinion about 15 years ago where he said, people don't invest in the Campbell Super Company you know, to make a, a, politi you know, a free speech point. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Right. Well, how's he signed on the Citizens United? Because the whole theory is that somehow whoever has the control of the corporation at the time can take the funds this is, a, and that's again, I wrote a thing called Conservative Collision Course, because the most logical tension here, Ron, is between the conservative political theorists on the corporation and this thing, because they were the ones the most suspicious of this kind of thing, because they thought that every corporation was going to be the Ford Foundation. You know, they're evil, the Ford Foundation. So, Catherine, you've, you've had the wisdom so far to say nothing. <laughs> Sandwiched in you, here. You've, you've, uh, That's because Larry Sonsini and others from Wilson Sonsini are now at, in Iowa <laughs> for their favorite candidate for whom they've won a very close election. Can any trivia, can anybody know who that is, their favorite candidate? And the close election. They won a close election, very controversial. 
If there's a tainted thing tonight, you'll see Larry there at the ballot box. Carly Fiorina, who pulled out the you know the PHP compact thing. Catherine was uh, Catherine was five years old and carrying <laughs> That's right. Like most corporations, Wilson is not of one political spectrum, right? So yes. no, but it's um, whatever Larry says. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually thought it would be interesting to talk about the fiduciary duty interaction here because you started getting to that point, right? right? Which is how does, okay, who's the person who's making the decision of am I going to give money to X candidate, Y candidate? And how does that person's fiduciary duties intersect? Well, and that's the point I make in this other article, which is if you accept, as I do, that within the strict domain of corporate law, that at least as to Delaware corporations, within the bounds of your legal discretion, right? And I want to emphasize that, within the bounds of your legal discretion, which means you have to honor the laws that society requires you to adhere to to protect itself, environmental laws, other things. But there's a lot of legal discretion. Mm -hmm. Now within those bounds, you're supposed to exercise your discretion in a way that you think is for the best interest of stockholders. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to get into, people try, my friend Lynn Stout and others confuse things, and their model of the world is greatly confounded by reality every day. <laughs> well, it is. Johnson controls, DuPont, everything, all this to sort of do the right thing. All directors are is elected by stockholders. The only ones who have rights within corporate law are stockholders. So you have to ask for the best interest of stockholders. It doesn't mean you have to do it set any particular time frame, but you have to be guided by the idea of doing that. What is it you're likely to spend on in the political process? And that's what scares me. It's essentially you're going to spend to influence government. You're going to send to advance the election of, of candidates and the defeat of candidates who are likely to adopt policies, regulatory policies that you think threaten your industries. And the collective effect of that is that each industry will essentially engage in the political process for a rent seeking. Now, we all breathe the air, we all drink the water, we all have grandchildren, we have people who want to be employed. Particular industries have a very narrow focus. The mining industry, I'm not sure I really want maximizing their utility at the, you know, at the expense of others. It's called externalities, right? If they can take the cost of doing business and shift them onto others, they're going to do it. So I think, Catherine, if they're actually operating within their fiduciary duties, what you're likely to see is expenditures that don't reflect the full range of human concerns that individuals have mm -hmm. and that reflect narrow influence-seeking objectives. And when you put that all together, I think you're going to increase externality risk for the economy in the sense of, I think, industries that create financial instability will be able to deter things. It's like, you know, look at the influence they're having now on something as simple, you know, that radical communist Paul Volcker. You know, incredibly right-wing, you know, left-wing guy, Paul Volcker, he's become over the years. He's a six-foot eight, he's the guy that freaking hammered the economy. Jimmy Carter gets no credit for killing inflation. Jimmy Carter killed inflation and his presidency by picking Paul Volcker, you know. And actually, it was good. George W. Bush's economic advisor yesterday wrote a good column praising Carter for that and saying, you know, he does. Paul Volcker hammered freaking inflation, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to tax the, he wants to make sure that there's not speculative trading. All the bankers say, we can't tell who does speculative trading. That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard, right? Because you know, all you got to do is get their comp tables. But they're going to do that. The, the energy concerns are going to lobby for reduced environmental restrictions and other sorts of things. And that's what you'll get the spending. Because I don't think corporate boards are actually going to, I think you'll see a few loonies who run their own companies use it. But I think the more danger is that the mainstream companies are going to essentially supplement what they can do in lobbying with political expenditures. And I think, Catherine, what they're going to be done is what, what Ron was saying about being shaken down. The people who are on the committees that regulate them will go to them for money, and they'll have no way to say no. Um, so and I also think it's interesting, though, if you think about, because the, the court also looks to, well, the traditional corporate governance things will step in to provide oversight. But in this type of arena, I'm like, how would you even do that? Would well, and I think know? the other thing is it asks us to be something in that capacity that you could have a system before because what you were doing as an investor was only part of what you were doing as a person. What I was saying to 
Joe and I were talking this a little bit about portfolio here. Mm -hmm. For most of us, sweat equity is our biggest part of our retirement. How we, what employment we're going to have over the next 30 years is going to be to determine what we put into the market. So we need two things, you know. We, you know, what, how much we put into our 401k will be determined a lot by what kind of job we have. So we have an interest in the economy, you know, employing people and producing wealth in a certain way. If we now, as investors, have to start thinking about things like politics, it really puts everybody in a weird thing because how do the mutual? I mean, again, I don't understand how the mutual funds think about this. Because I, I, I don't, and I think they want to abstain, and if they abstain, that just leaves it to corporate managers, which has been historically a problem. And so I said, I think this is one of those things, like, you actually can create a ludicrously harmful situation out of nothing. There was nothing, there were a lot of problems in our political system with contributions and everything, but this was not a broken part of it. And we've now broken it wide open, and I think we've created... There'll be a lot of corporate managers this year and, and people who spend time in the spring when they could be thinking about running their business better, you know, creating value, who will have to manage these things. Mm -hmm. And is that really good for us? But what, let's come back to the, the, to the money managers. Um, the, you love, I know. Right? Well, <laughs> but let's you and Lucian love them. Lucian and I have uh, interesting views. <laughs> but, you, but remember, well, he's you, a director you love them too when it comes time for them taking the conflict of interest transaction off of your desk. So you know, if we let the, if we let them if we let our shareholders uh, decide that we're going to vote on this and their vote their vote sanitizes. But this the vote is totally hey, it's a totally different thing I'm, because the reality is that the one thing that you can plausibly say everybody shares when they invest in the equity of a corporation, and this is the thing that everybody understood, was the objective in the corporation being profitable and providing a good return. That is the one unifying thing, and we've even got confounded. That's one of the issues with hedge funds and whether they're shorting and telling everything else, but the, 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 for the mainstream mutual funds, I will concede that I believe when most of them, when you put them all together, they probably want to do something that, you know, maximizes the return. At least it's a, a fair inference. When it comes to voting on something like this, I think the problem is that there's no way for them to actually represent everybody else on these other questions because... No, they they can't because the, their customers don't agree. Exactly. And they will all agree. There's a wonderful theory. And by the way, these industries are actually in clash about these things too because, I mean, it's not always, you know, you've got portfolio issues around these kinds of things as well. Because there can be rent-seeking industries that actually their ability to reduce government regulation can harm the growth of other industries. Um, and so, so the, you know, you, with you and Joe talking about economics, there's a but there's a there's a wonderful uh, there's a wonderful economic uh, e economic theorem which basically says we can show you that what shareholders will all agree about is maximizing profits. And the reason for that, the assumption they make is because they will all do that in the circumstance in which the corporation's behavior affects them only through the value of their stock. As soon as you drop that assumption. It disappears, particularly with political stock. Because, yes, I want you to, I want you to maximize the value of profits. But on the other hand, I care about something else. I may not want you to support an employer who... Uh, and uh, Milton Friedman said something, right, Ron? I mean, people forget about Milton Friedman. He said something very important. The job of a public corporation is to maximize profits within the rules of the game, which means we want an industry to maximize profit, but that doesn't mean we want them to actually pollute the rivers, to pollute the air. We want them within the bounds of decent see that we set as a society to be profitable. Absolutely. And, then, and the problem is this bleeds into that. And no, so now come back to the money managers. Um, the, what I haven't seen yet, and which would not surprise me, are the push on the money managers to vote this way, to vote uh, to yes. uh, get aggressive about the political contribution issue. Because by and large, I don't think the money management business, as you said, much cares about that issue. 
And if they can stay out of the fight, they just as soon like but to stay but out there's of the a fight. But there's a fundamental, there's a fundamental paradox here, and 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 it's one that I don't think has an easy solution. And that is, if you're, and let me let me go to an example that is extreme, and I'm going to the extreme example because it's easiest Cause to understand. Because that's why we love you. There you go. <laughs> you looked right at me when you said that too. So I'm kind of wondering you, why. Yeah. Uh, no. So so <laughs> suppose so, so get ready for acceptance. Yeah. Smith Smith and Wesson, gun manufacturer, publicly traded. Okay. America. Can, all right. Can Art you? Of America. Do you think they make political contributions? <laughs> okay. If you are a shareholder in Smith and Wesson. Don't you hope that they're making political contributions, Is right? It's a breach of duty not to make them, My right? point. It would yeah. be a breach of duty not yeah. to make political contributions. And can you guess where those political contributions are going? All right. Now, <laughs> if you stop and if you think about it, it is rational for every corporation to lobby for activities that are consistent with their business plan and business objectives, right? And in some situations, in the vast majority of situations, although there are some exceptions, maybe Sheldon Adelson is an exception, the areas in which these corporations are spending money would be largely predictable. Well, by the take, way, I, take, Sheldon take Adelson spends guess. on the same stuff, the, the, the stuff. He spends on stuff like you're talking about, too. Right. Very few of these people, the Koch brothers, have spent enormous amounts of money influencing the political process. But it's, it's to, interesting. They're not a publicly traded corporation. No, no, it's I understand. their own money. <clears throat> well, that's an interesting dynamic too, because again, yeah, rich I think, people. Well, no, no, I, I think there that it, you cannot separate that from corporate power. There's the whole issue about whether. But that's a much heavier. No, no, no. Lift. But I, I didn't but yeah, say you're I, going to a heavier lift. I, I, no, no, no. What I'm saying about is whether you're using. They do not own the corporations. They own the shares of their corporations. Correct. That is not the same thing. If they own their corporations and their corporations harm somebody, they'd be personally liable. If they want to take wealth out of the corporation, then they have to be, pay taxes on it, like at least they're supposed to be, they are moderate taxes, very less than sweat equity people. So we got to be careful about that. Or oh, unless but, they but, decide to die and get the step up in basis. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, but what I'm saying about this is I don't disagree with you that it is rational for businesses to wish to shift externality risk to society. And that's why I believe that the bulk of the spending over time will be in that, which mm -hmm. will reduce societal regulation of corporations. Exactly. And it turns the historical relationship of society's creation upside down. Because we created these entities, and it was from the beginning, and these, from the beginning, it was suspicion about them, about whether they would become larger than their creator. And if you think about the aggregations of wealth that are held in the corporate form, they swamp individuals. And there, if you and the whole model was that we could we could get the value out of wealth maximization from corporations because we could regulate them. That's been the whole argument about why we didn't. I think the point that we're agreeing on is that that dynamic is breaking down. No, and what it does, what it profoundly argues for, is for actually. <laughs> the social responsibility movement for them arguing that within corporate law itself, there have to be mandatory duties to other constituencies. There have to be actual legal guarantees for other constituencies. It argues for, for voting rights and pass-through rights to individual investors that look through money managers on issues where money managers actually can't fairly represent individual interests. And it upsets what I said about messing up two realms, is I'm not sure that that's economically efficient. I wouldn't go there, and I don't think we needed to go there as a society. We may have had a Supreme Court that now requires and throws up for grabs things and makes things that are economically efficient not doable anymore because the social harm that could result if there's not a change is too considerable. I'm not prepared as a citizen to feel good about the energy industry increasing its clout when I see no, in, no evidence at all that it has had too little in it, uh, influence and when I see huge evidence that it's already too influential, has impeded our ability to address climate change, has allowed them to harm key uh, 
you know, environmental assets without much accountability and has allowed them to stifle uh, competition, distort pricing incentives in for energy, um, and we want to make them more powerful? I, I, I don't really get that. And I don't think that many of us, the fact that we might have the index 500 and that contains some energy things means that we want to make them more influential. Well, you know, one of, just one, and I want to get to a legal point over here. One of the things that really strikes me uh, about the Hobby Lobby decision and, and Citizens United is that neither decision is conservative at all in the traditional sense yes. of the term conservative. That, that if you're going to be a conservative judge, you basically want to decide what you need to decide to resolve the question at hand, and you don't want to reach beyond the four corners of the case and controversy before you because you don't know what these other facts and circumstances are going to be. And, and that's why it was very easy, for example, at Citizens United, for the Supreme Court to have done what it has done in the past, which is when you have corporations before it that are purely expressive in nature. Yep. Draw the distinction. That there is a distinction. And you know that people invested in it. It had nothing to do with that. The other thing that it could have done, as I said, it was very easy. If The thing that fit with thing is what Congress did. Congress allowed corporations to use their resources to create a political action committee, to reach out to investors and managers, and raise voluntary contributions, and therefore act as a collective mechanism for speech. That fits very well with the for-profit model because it allows mm -hmm. those investors at Smith & Wesson, because I would argue that a lot of investors at Smith & Wesson invest through index funds and don't have any, you know, if they're in the index. The others mm -hmm. are, there's a lot of investors who give to the NRA and don't necessarily, they think they're smarter about than Smith & Wesson. Right. But it would allow you to give to the Smith & Wesson PAC. Now, people would say, those PACs weren't able to raise huge amounts of money. They mostly raised their funds. Well, yeah, that's kind of telling, isn't it? How many of you are interested in giving money to the political process through an intermediary. I mean, even on human impulse, if you wanted to give to a con congressional candidate, don't you want to do it yourself? And maybe if you call their office, they'll know your name? I mean, that's the other thing about it. The whole thing is just bizarre. Well, and, I, and it isn't conservative. It was, it was, it's, uh, but none of this is conservative. There's this a movement of judges engaged in social change. Uh, well, you saw that with the, the Affordable Care Act decision. Could have been a one paragraph decision. Justice Rehnquist would have written it this way. As long as an act of Congress is within any of its powers, it does not matter what Congress calls it. And because the mandate, the individual mandate, is clearly within the taxing powers of Congress. It is constitutional. End of story. Didn't need the soliloquy on the Commerce Clause and all this stuff. And they struck down on Medicaid expansion because Mississippi, you know what Mississippi needs? Mississippi's got to be respected, right? I don't know. You know, I <laughs> hope it's changed, let's just say. But Mississippi, Alabama, all these states that most need the Medicaid expansion, they need to be respected because they're independent sovereigns. But you know, the one thing they got to have is their Medicaid. And even though Congress, specifically when it enacted Medicaid, reserved the right to amend the program, and even though Congress has amended the program in the past, and even though Congress, when they expanded it, did a five-year transitional period in which the federal government basically paid everything, they're such an independent sovereign, but they got to have their Medicaid that they don't have to opt in. And by the way, there's all these southern states screwing themselves up. The technical term would begin F, freaking themselves up. They're the ones the most needed, and they're wrecking their own budgets because people like you in California and people like me in Delaware, we pay more taxes than we get back. But Robert struck that down. And nobody talks about that because he saved the other. But that's an outrageous thing that puts pressure on Congress not to announce it. And what is the principle? And it raises, right. It and raises what is other, the principle? What is the exactly. principle? We can't now expand federal programs? We and can't require that, anything? Because they're so independent as states, but they're, it's like a kid who tells you, I want to live, you know, how many of you are 20? So I want to live at parents' home. I want to live down now, and I want to do whatever I want forever. Because <clears throat> I've become entitled. But that so, was an act of activism as well. So, I mean, we've upset the whole thing. And by the way, there's an other thing in the administrative process. I'm not for proxy. I wasn't for federal proxy access. I thought it was a dumb move. 
thought it was unnecessary. Never dreamed in my life when Congress, Congress specifically said that the SEC may adopt proxy license. And the DC Circuit said, you may not. So the other thing for society now is we have the court throwing obstacles, Joe, in the way of regulation. So you have the corporations being able to spend more. You have the courts being more activists in striking down regulations. Then if it gets to the regulatory process, they've, they've actually strike down, they strike down the statutes. When they can't strike down the statutes, there is a case in the Ninth Circuit a county out here banned gun sales from the county fair. Got struck down. You know what the ground was? Impingement on free speech rights. Selling guns at the county fair was a free speech right. And in the business realm, we've now, and I think the climate change, I would not have passed the climate change regulation if I were a member of the SEC. But it's now a free, for a free speech Impingement. Don't look require, at me for agreement. Well, what I'm, saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is, no, you were asking a question about whether right. this is conservative. No, this is not. This is activism, and it, it, it goes across the entire dimension of regulating the, a modern economy. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and it, it, is, it, it is astonishing. And things like Chevron and Auer in the administrative law field are under attack. Um, it's the MSU doctrine, what I call you can decide how to use the S. Stuff is the non-profane way. It's called the making stuff up doctrine. So look, so one way of thinking of, about the way you've put it, Leo, is that at least for a period of time, um, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't win in Citizens United by an opinion that says Citizens United is correctly decided for Citizens United and nobody else. Yes. Short opinion. So you, in the end, you move for a period of time out of the courts. And that brings me back to markets and the asset managers. Because in the end, they're in a business. And they're in a business that's re pretty responsive to asset flows. They don't much care about the political issue one way or another. They'd like to duck it. But um, here's the so here's the analogy. Um, you, you'll this is a stretch, but some of you will remember it. A dolphin-free tuna. Consumers. I've never understood why put, people put dolphin in the same cans with tuna. <laughs> the dog, they, yeah, you put them in the same nets with tuna <laughs> is the issue. No, but, I mean, I wanted my tuna was, pure. I thought it was a perfectly reasonable consumer they, demand. No, they, if I wish to eat dolphin, if I wish to mix it, I like to make my own. Blood. No, they didn't, eat, they didn't eat it. They just killed it. <laughs> but, but the point you being, the they, <laughs> a, but consumers turned. It's like pork-free beef. <laughs> It's exactly like horse free. If I want to eat a horse, I'll go get Sometimes you can't follow it. But the, um, you, should but, see, you should see what it's like appearing <laughs> before him in oral argument. <laughs> Your Honor, before you ask me this question, let me answer the question you're about to ask. <laughs> but the, the, the access to the money managers is through the money. And it, this politics is an easy one because they don't much care. The but, but here's the salient, I mean, here's the issue. One, it, money managers, I would agree with you that there is, and I actually think I've written a lot about fund hopping and stuff like that. Money managers are a federally subsidized industry. And consumer choice is highly constrained by getting into the 401k program of private sector employers. And the the key money managers have a great incentive not to get out of step with each other. And I think one of the issues, I've, you and I have talked about this in the past, I think it would be hugely beneficial for American corporate governance to get an in, independent of the council and institutional investors, what I call the center of the plate investors community together, which would be Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, the people who actually want to be old fashioned, they want to actually focus on investment returns. I think they, they actually, Ron, would like a lot less political hoo-ha in the corporate Ooh, government's yes. environment itself. And I don't really, I think the simplest thing is not disclosure, it's to say, we don't wish you to do this. 
we think this is not value maximizing. We actually want you to run the business. Our investors, if they're diverse, and if they want to, when you they get a dividend for back from us or something like that, or they take it out and they want to give to a politician, they'd like to get credit for it themselves. I think if you could get them thinking, they're in the CII, I think it's all weird, and I don't know what corporations are doing, and by the way, that bill that Congress passed has to have had an influence on them because they're a regulated industry, and don't think that they're not, I mean, they get, when they're scared of public investment funds, uh, Ron, which many of them are, imagine how scared they are of Congress. And so when Congress sends a message like that, that the SEC may not act on it, I'm not sure that they feel entirely um, on, you know, uninhibited in, right. I do think, I agree with you, I don't think Fidelity Vanguard, I think they'd love it for it to go away. I think they like, they love half the stockholder proposals to go away um, because of the same things. They don't want to spend your money or their time on thinking about these things. Lucian has made it, we mandate people to vote on things they don't want to vote on. Uh, and, and one of my ideas, Ron, has been, if we trust institutional investors, let's trust them to decide when they want to vote and let them think again about this and make the people who want to have change actually galvanize the electorate. My sense is they'll have fewer votes on a lot of their stuff than Ron, Rick Santorum will have tonight. Yeah, and, I, and, I actually, <laughs> and I think that's fine, but would you, what I, I guess what I want to say is there is, a, there is a, one way to come at this is through the product market. And so there was a buy. It is, but think about how Kafkaian Orwellian it is that we're talking about getting at the American political process and the flow of money into it through the mutual fund product market. I mean, no, it I, is worth no. just pondering how absurd things are just when no, that's the so, window. No, no, but but I think I think Ron Ron's got a, a really good point. If you look at the efficacy of a boycott effort the ability to achieve a result in the capital market is really weak compared to the ability to achieve a result in the product market. I don't dis well, and or no, no, no. If we, if people for whatever reason started boycotting, and I don't want to pick a company. They pick can't a company. boycott. They can't boycott because here's the thing for American investors. Your exit choices, the whole Wall Street rule, and why Lucian is absurd, and I love Lucian, but he's absurd on this, right? They say the Wall Street rule doesn't work for individual investors and individual companies. Your exit choice is to go to another Fidelity fund or to the Vanguard funds or to the Barclay funds. You don't get to buy individual stocks. You get to get mm -hmm. the fund families that your employer picks. I agree with you. See, if Fidelity, Barclays, BlackRock, would all stand up, they could change the market and end this tomorrow. And it would be good for them, but that's not their behavior. They could also, frankly, cut down on frivolous litigation. They could do a lot of things. But they don't have, their interests are not identical to those of their investors. I don't believe they view this as a distinguishing point that's going to actually attract capital. I don't think that they know how to do it, and I think that they are subject to more influences than you might be aware of from other sources, and they're not exactly heroes of history. They may make trust officers look I, brave. Listen, um, it's, it's the Wayne Gretzky story. You remember Wayne, the best hockey player ever, and it's also fair that he probably got hit with hockey sticks more than, uh, more than he should have. But he said something really well. They said, Wayne, how come you're such a good I'm hockey player? Right? And the answer was, I go where the Google puck's going to be. No? Now, there was a... He does go where his puck going to be, he's, but he... he but, no, but, but I want us to go where the puck is going to be. So two months ago, there was a meeting of institutions that had, you know, it probably in the aggregate, including uh, uh, Sw Swedish pension funds, about a trillion dollars. And what they got presented to them was a product, which was essentially an index, but it was carbon light. It reduces the product, reduced the product, reduced the uh, carbon footprint by 40% with zero tracking error historically. Now, whether that tracking or that zero survived the last year and a half is a different story. But it for all practical purposes, for an investor who cares about this, for a small college that could not, like Stanford, build its own, uh, there's a market for this kind of a product where investors like you, like me, get to say, I want to stay out of, uh, I want to stay out of the, 
the carbon market. And it's kind of cool because the way the product's presented, there's kind of a, it's got an option-like quality with respect to climate change legislation. No, no, I mean, I like that. So, and, no, and I've already... There, but, but the idea of doing it on political contributions? It, well, and, how would no, you do it? I, I mean, what I, what I, what I imagine is a world in which and boycott is is um, is too strong, but particularly also a seems single to be gender biased. <laughs> All right, girl cot. <laughs> That's I hadn't thought of that. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, there's a. Um, the, the one difference between the asset management market and holding a share of corporate stock is when I sell my share of corporate stock, even in the aggregate, it's not obvious it's going to have much of an impact on anybody who's making decisions. If I move money out of an asset management operation where it's a, um, it's a massively volume driven, it's a mi massively volume driven business, that affects it. So there is a there is the potential for the bunch of us to be actually begin to have an influence. There is, on those but the, the mobilization thing that you're trying to achieve, I think, again, I, I I don't. To me, it's 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 terrible for our society that we're down to this because one of the things that we're talking about here is. I, I love what you just said about the index fund, but you may remember conversations I've had where the most rational deviations from passivity are exactly what you just talked about. Because I talked about the funds for years having an index 500 minus the 50 companies who had the most shaky um, um, disclosures and other things. And the index funds actually using their um, analysts, the people when they were short weighting in their active funds. And what they always said about that is, that would make sense. But to prove out the investment thesis, the way that people fund hop, even though over time it's likely to work, it just, it, 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 it's, and so we don't do that. And so the idea that they're going to go into politics over this stuff, and you get people, you know, because there's a whole issue with American investors, and we buy, we sell. You know, we sell low and buy high all the time. Oh, everyone. No, no. I mean, this is dumb. I mean, one of the things and why I believe in pricing friction. So I'm just saying that the idea of mobilizing all the investor community around this. The other thing is, we look, we have gotten an ideological bent around this. And people of the right are not wrong. It was always absurd when people say, ah, oh, the labor unions have so much money. And there, you know, they got all the spending. Well, that's just not true. I mean, in terms of the math, the labor unions have been outgunned by capital for years and years, and it's going to get worse. And why, why is labor outgunned by capital? Does everybody know? Have you seen those ads about they had the Nobel Prize winner explaining to the person doing TurboTax definition? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if labor had money, it would be capital. Capital has way more money. And so I just think the idea here of trying to create a political movement within, frankly, a constrained market where for most investors it's a choice between four or five families, I'm not sure who's going to break. To me, the more cooperative thing would be to get the good people of Fidelity and Vanguard and BlackRock and Barclays to sit down and go, this is stupid and we're going to actually person up and take a stand. My sense is it'd be interesting to have those conversations, Ron, about what they've heard behind the scenes from other people putting pressure on them about whether, because they what they've done today, the hero of history they are, they are litmus paper on this, except they won't even go into the water. Sure. They are Switzerland. What I mean is they have determined to not vote on these proposals. And they've put a very accurate disclosure out. You know why they don't vote on it? They basically don't know how to reconcile the interests of their investors, and they just abstain. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to get them from abstention okay. to the hustings of history, um, 
It's amazing. We've spent the entire time on this. <laughs> just keep it up. We, so, we don't disagree about Citizens United. No, no, I know. It's just you play the cards you hit the moment. You play the well, no, and I'm got. very worried about, you know, I think it's it's become kind of loot. And again, I'm, I'm opposed to it on a few grounds, and I don't want to distort. I actually think it's important that businesses function and be profitable. And I think raising the American cost of capital is a very dangerous thing to do. Part of why I'm concerned about excess litigation costs is I want us to be effective and efficient. I actually think healthcare, we actually went through, you know, we would be better off for our businesses for job creation if we, you know, actually had more of a non business based thing because we're the only place in the Western world, in the capitalist world, and I don't believe that Australia and Canada and England and Germany are communist nations. That's my bias, Japan. If you do, that's fine, but I believe they're capitalists. And when you locate a job in those nations, it's not on the back of the employer. And so we've got a lot of issues, and I think freighting now the, the, or the business community with a debate about political costs, and it will raise and distract people from job creation. And if you don't think part of the inversion so are not two first for business, CEOs tend to think towards the end of their tenure. And part of why there's a twofer, by going there, they'll reduce the taxes, and that'll make it easier for them to meet their number, and that'll take some pressure off them. And you, But the big twofer is you can get the institutional investors to vote for the inversion to a, corp, to a governance place that has basically no political activism in corporate and these CEOs are retreating to silent places to get away from the hoo-ha of the American marketplace. And, and, and so, you know, Ireland's a lovely place to play golf, but there are basically no proxy contests in Ireland. There are no stockholder proposals. And, you know, um, it is ironic, right? Johnson Controls go on the Ireland. Who's the world's greatest Dutch rock band? Anybody know? You too, insufferable leftist, but Bono, because he wouldn't pay his Irish taxes, is a Dutch rock band. Did you know that? So, 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 moment of shameless self promotion for the rock center. Kathy Wang, who's here, actually wrote an article about inversions and the corporate governance implications of it, and nailed your issue about a year ago. And the Wilson Santini so, has an argument, has an article on perversion in the corporate governance um, system, which is um, available to those of you older than twenty one. If you sign releases and you do not use university computers. So let's let's go let's go to the audience and let's have some David questions. David Berger, I believe, authored most of that. <laughs> <laughs> With former okay. Chancellor Chandler, my colleague and friend too. Huh? <laughs> I suppose I, I, I suppose it's not a bad you know I, I suppose we would rather know more about what they're doing. Um, again, what I'm concerned about is that costs money, and it's not clear to me that the referees around that. What are you going to do with that disclosure? And again, I mean, I'm I, I just I'm not blaming the money managers. It's just not what they're designed to do. So I guess in this imperfect world, I would still say we would want to know more about what they're doing. But I think, again, there's a societal cost, and I think we need to recognize that, you know, every time you require an expenditure from our businesses, that's, that, that costs people in terms of job creation. And I think it's an unfortunate thing. And it's, again, it's essentially a response to a problem that was created by um, – by people in robes. It doesn't give shareholders a mechanism to then use. The I actually courts, think it doesn't right? give. I, yeah, and I don't think it's going to give shareholders. I think what. Well, I mean, I think there'll be some investment. You know, if you see something ludicrous, I think what you're going to see is what Ron and 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 and, and Joe were talking about, which is you're going to see contributions that are largely what I would call. You know, externality reduction. I mean, you know, externality seeking, rent seeking mm -hmm. contributions to people who are candidates that they view will help the industry by not <coughs> regulating it, by favoring its interest. And to me, as a citizen, I find that dismaying. 
and problematic. But I would, argue, I would say in the world that we're in, I would rather know that they're doing it. I would rather us not have to be there and to be distracting our business community from this. I'm not, I, I, and I think that disclosures will be more powerful information for members of the public in general than it really will be from the shareholder community um, itself. Um, I think that it's the people who may want to do something politically about this as, as citizens who will gain, and that's a, that's a value. But again, I, it's, I think you know, it's sort of unfortunate to create a need to have a disclosure when a bill called McCain-Feingold, remember that guy McCain? This was a bipartisan bill. There was nothing to disclose because it regulated it, and the PACs disclosed. See, that's the thing is we had disclosure of what they mm -hmm. did because the corporate PACs had to disclose for the Federal Election Commission process. And so this is entirely a making of a five to a five member majority of the United States Supreme Court. Other questions? You may approach the bench. <laughs> well, thank you, Your Honor. To what extent um, may Citizens United have introduced a mechanism by which foreign capital can influence the American political process? I think it's a great question because I don't understand the limitations, the capacious <clears throat> limitations of the opinion. And you know, Justice Kennedy has many qualities, but he writes huge. I mean, he does. He's a Salzburg guy, mm -hmm. and he, when he writes, it's a, it, it's it, it, it's an urban landscape, and it's it's hewn. You know, it's one of those we gave him balls, and there's nothing about the opinion that suggests that it's limited to domestic corporations. And I don't even understand the concept anymore because that's the other thing that it misunderstands about corporations. Corporations are a republic that are responsive to a citizenry of equity investors. And as we see from their behavior, it, there's nothing like corporate patriotism. I mean, Johnson Control, I mean, people should, there is a shame. I mean, I actually don't think the, I don't like to shame people. It's not my thing. I'm an imperfect person. I do think an industry that went to Congress and got a bailout and then wishes to shirk its American identity is pretty vomitous. Well, I mean, what do you think you say about that, right? But the reality is, who elects the board of Johnson Control? And I think you're onto that. I mean, there is no cabining to this. And even for American corporations, what does it mean to be an American corporation if you know three quarters of your jobs are outside the borders? You know, and, 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 and even your investor class, who knows what the so investor class is? you have a Delaware is? corporation, 90% owned by foreigners, 90% of its revenue outside the United yeah, States. Absolutely. I mean, it's it, American, it, it, and by the same token, you can have a foreign corporation. Exactly. All right, British corporation, 90% owned by U.S. investors, 90% of the revenue. So the, the idea of giving a citizenship to a corporation and even understanding when is a corporation American or not becomes really problematic. Well, yes. That's what you raised before as well, right? The, the corporation doesn't have any sort of moral obligations, right? So Johnson's, right? The board. They're supposed to be maximizing the value, right? So they go off to Ireland. They don't have the moral, or even the impetus to have the moral d decision to say, oh, I got a bailout. Maybe I shouldn't do this. No, and I think my, <laughs> my big issue is, you know, many of you know, I mean, I, 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 it's funny. I get hit from the right. I mean, I get hit from the left all the time saying, you know, the Strines an apologist who talks about directors having to focus on the best interests of the stockholders. I'm a liberal. I was never afraid to be called a liberal. You know, the progressive, you know what a progressive is, right? Progressive is a person who was afraid to be called a liberal when it was unpopular, and so they adopted a thing that was more associated with Teddy Roosevelt. I'm a liberal. <laughs> I, not being clear-eyed about what corporate boards can do is really societally harmful. You, when you're elected by only one constituency, and when you're under a domain of law where they're the only ones who have voting rights, that's a design thing, right? I think my friend Lynn's down on his ignore. Like, you don't want to say, oh, there's no case. That, well, I said there's 20 cases. There's tw 200 cases. Yes, Ford v. Dodge very much means what it says. You've got to, you know, if you plead guilty, you get some slack under the business group, but when you plead guilty, you're She's nailed. Guilty. And under Delaware law, we've been very clear. And the Revlon case, it says, what it says, 
it, it illustrates that, and it makes very clear that you always have to have a rational connection for to stockholders. That's why Revlon requires you to focus on price. So boards are going to do what they're, they're responsible. They're not heroes. I mean, the other thing is to think that corporate boards are, are representative of society is problematic for a lot of reasons anyway. Like, even if you wanted them to pursue the public good, I'm not sure you which you know most of us would identify with them. But now you have this situation where the capital markets are frankly extremely intense. You know, people are looking for return. One of the problems for money managers now is there's less of an ability to separate yourself when there's all these eyeballs. You know, it's not the 1980s, and so there's not a lot of, of room for slack. And so I don't know how we think the boards are going to act in a way and again, I don't know how they reconcile the diverse views of their investors. I do understand them making rent-seeking, externality-enhancing political contributions. I get that. I don't. I think most boards would prefer to be inhibited from that. Um, but I don't think um, I don't understand the national identity of corporations. I don't understand it at all anymore. Yes, um, so and and corporations are not. You see what they do to communities. The DuPont, we, you know, we have no DuPont company in, in the city of Wilmington anymore. They moved out of their headquarters. And they tried to blame it on Nelson Peltz, but it wasn't Nelson Peltz who made them do that. And, our, and it's a fully paid for headquarters. <coughs> and it's empty. And Which means so, they didn't sell it. <laughs> well, no. You know what they did? They gave it to the spin-off chemical company as a sort of, you know, which didn't need it. Right. So I'm just saying that boards, you know, even if they wish to do the right thing, and I think there are very few heroes of history examples of boards, you know, the whole model is the independent trust directors are like the trustees of a university and they'll fall on the sword. When have we seen that? They're in a network and they wish to be popular and they're different people they want to be popular with now and they're the mobilized capital. And so the idea that corporations are going to be patriotic to any particular interest or any nation. It doesn't make any sense. And in fact, one of the things I've written about <clears throat> is we need international cooperation more than ever if we're going to preserve the way of life that we always talk about when people challenge our nation, right? When people would say, well, the United States isn't, you know, when we used to debate with the Soviet Union, we don't take care. Oh, yeah, we have Social Security. We have unemployment insurance. We do all those things, right? We have minimum wage. We have maximum hours. We ended up child labor. We're proud of those things, and we damn well should be. The only way we can protect those things going forward is by extending the regulatory structure over business to be extensive with the coextensive with the economy. People forget what the New Deal was about. The New Deal, in many ways, was about the fact that we be, had become a national economy. But we had out the economy had outgrown the government's ability to regulate it. We now have an international economy, but we don't regulate business behavior in a way that's cooperative with our OCD, EDCD colleagues, and we need to. And the kind of rent seeking we're seeing from businesses around inversions, things like that, you know, the tax haven issues with the Cook Islands and others, we're eating our own sinew as a Western world, and I mean Western world writ large, because I include in that South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, uh, Australasia. These are the things that we're proud of, right? That we had an inclusive form of capitalism. We can't protect that if we don't act together. And I think by increasing the political clout of these organizations that really have no national identity, we make it less likely that we're able to be able to internationalize the kind of protections we need. And we need to be able to do that in a way that doesn't inhibit the developing world. But you know, I don't think actually allow increasing the capacity of these organizations to play off societies against each other is a particularly propitious development. Well, when we yeah. figure that out, let's tell let's the know. EU how to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, well, we're, we're over time. But one thing, well, I'll just say about that. One thing we can, no, I want to say this. One thing we I tried. Can, no, but one thing we can do is to stop demonizing our friends and to start recognizing that what we have in common with people in the EU and Australia and Canada and Japan and Hong Kong and, and Korea and in Latin America, for example, people in Brazil have to get a visa to come here. You know how degrading that is for them? 
And you know how much more people in Brazil have in common and their economy has in common with a lot of nations that we suck up to? And so I would say that we could do a lot better and that won't be easy and the EU is an experiment that Americans need to succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, thank you very much for joining us.